after the BRAP story, I think the most interesting story in the last year has been the ALK story, and it is my pleasure to welcome Alice Shaw. She's an assistant professor of medicine at HMS and at Mass General, who works in lung cancer. Alice? Thank you. Um, so thank you, Nupur. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to present on behalf of all of the phase one crizotinib investigators, the ALK story. Um, as most of you know, ALK and the targeted therapy crizotinib have really been catapulted into prime time, culminating last week in Dr. Eunice Kwok's New England Journal of Medicine publication reporting the activity of crizotinib in ALK patients. So I think now is a good time to think about and review sort of the factors that really contributed to the rapid development of crizotinib um, in the clinic. Um, and here are three factors that I think were the major uh, contributors, and this is, will serve as a general outline of my talk today. So first is the molecular target itself, that being ELK, and specifically EML for ELK. Um, <clears throat> ELK is actually a remarkably good target. Um, it's really not expressed in almost any tissues in, in most patients. Um, and in addition, ELK rearrangements, which we'll talk about, um, do confer oncogene addiction. The second factor has to do with our ability to screen rapidly patients for the presence of these ALK rearrangements. And uh, at MGH, John Iafrady and Pathology really spearheaded this effort to develop um, a uh, screening test for ALK, and this has become now the gold standard for diagnosing ALK-positive lung cancer. This clearly facilitated patient selection for the phase one trial. And finally, of course, we'll um, end on the targeted therapy, um, crizotinib, also known as PF234-1066, which is a small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitor targeting both ALK as well as MET. <coughs> So because not all of you think about lung cancer on a regular basis, I just included this slide um, as background. Um, most of you do know, though, that lung cancer is associated with a high mortality. Um, that's what this slide shows. In addition, what I wanted to emphasize in this slide is that not that much progress has been made over the last several decades. I think this will start to change now that we have these new targeted therapies. I think where we've made the most progress the last five years or so in lung cancer is defining and really understanding now that there are molecular subsets of lung cancer. So lung cancer is not all one disease. Lung cancer is in fact made up of different diseases. And in many cases, the subsets of lung cancer can be defined by specific oncogenic driver mutations. So shown here is what we know so far about uh, lung cancer, and in, in particular non-small cell lung cancer. You can see that we know the most about, or we have the most patients who have activating KRAS mutations. We also have quite a few patients with activating EGFR mutations. Shown by the yellow pie, the yellow slice in this pie is the proportion of patients who have ALK rearrangements. It is on the smaller side roughly three to 4% of non-small cell lung cancer patients. But given the large absolute number of patients, this still works out to about 68,000 patients per year in this country alone. So it's a significant number of patients. So back in August of 2007, Dr. Hiro Mano's group um, first reported the discovery of this new oncogenic fusion kinase in non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, what they did was they actually did a very sort of traditional oncogenic assay to identify transforming genes, and they identified this gene from a patient with non-small cell lung cancer. EMF4-ALK refers to this fusion protein that's shown here in the middle, where the amino terminal portion of EMF4, which is a microtubule-associated protein, is fused to the entire tyrosine kinase domain of ALK, anaplastic lymphoma kinase. And this creates this constitutively activated fusion kinase EMF4-ALK shown in the middle. Now, Dr. Mano went on to show that this fusion kinase has potent oncogenic activity, both in vitro and in vivo, shown here as one example of his experiments. Um, here, 3T3 cells were transfected with various expression plasmids. Um, you can see in the red box that the expression plasmid encoding eml 4 alk fusion was able to form foci in these transformation assays, as well as subcutaneous tumors in nude mice. <coughs> 
Now, next to the red box is an EML4 ALK fusion that actually has a point mutation at residue 589 that now kills the kinase activity of ALK. And you can see that now you completely abolish the transformation activity of EML4 ALK, showing that the kinase activity of the EML4 ALK fusion is critical for transformation. Now, Dr. Soda, um, together with Dr. Mano, went on to generate now a transgenic mouse, and this was to address two important questions. The first is, is the EML4 ALK fusion um, sufficient to drive tumor formation? And the second question is, are these EML4 ALK-driven tumors now addicted to ALK signaling? So here he generated a transgenic mouse um, in which EML4 ALK fusion was um, driven by a lung epithelial-specific promoter, SPC, stands for surfactant protein C. And you can see in panel B that in all of the transgenic animals from the time of birth, there were numerous pulmonary adenocarcinomas. By H&E staining, as shown in panel C, you can see that these were all adenocarcinomas. And shown below is the immunohistochemistry showing expression of ALK in all of these ALK-driven lung cancers. So Dr. Soto went on now to test the activity of a small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitor of ALK. This is not crizotinib, this is a different drug. Um, and here he took his transgenic animals, divided them into two, two cohorts. The cohort on the left, panel A, are animals that are treated with vehicle. And you can see over about a three and a half week time period that these mice do gradually develop tumors. They're shown in these hatched bars and they're slowly enlarging over this period of time. And panel B are the animals that were treated with the ALK inhibitor. And you can see over the same period of time that these tumors now dramatically regress. And this was confirmed histologically as shown below in C, where the control animals have these large sort of purple appearing tumors. And in contrast, those animals that were treated with the ALK inhibitor now show much smaller tumors, much less extensive tumor burden. These experiments taken together show you that these ALK-driven tumors really are addicted to ALK um, signaling and are sensitive to inhibition of ALK. So once Dr. Mano reported um, his findings, um, Dr. Iafredi started working um, very quickly on a way to identify patients who might harbor ALK fusions, ALK rearrangements in, in tumor samples. Um, and to do this, he actually uh, developed this FISH assay, which has now become the gold standard for screening um, patients. And briefly, what this FISH assay involves are two probes, a red and a green probe, that flank the highly conserved translocation site within ALK. In the presence of a rearrangement, these two probes are now separated, resulting in, resulting in a splitting of the red and green signals, as shown by the red arrows in this positive sample. There are other ways to actually identify ALK rearrangements in lung cancers, and here are the two other main ways. Um, we actually did, once John was developing the FISH assay, we did go back and, and validated and confirmed the presence of ALK rearrangement using these two assays. One is a RT-PCR assay, as shown in A, and the second is an immunohistochemistry assay, as shown in B. So what, right now, we've been primarily using the FISH assay, but one day, certainly, the immunohistochemistry may become uh, our, our a diagnostic test of choice. So now with this screening um, test um, in hand, we are now actually able to screen our patients that were seen at MGH. Actually, now there have been quite a few case series published from around the world reporting on ALK patients. And so rather than tell you about all of those, I was actually going to share with you our experience at Mass General. So over about a two-year period from December 2007 to December 2009, we screened almost 500 patients for the presence of ALK. These were screened through our medical oncology clinic. So these were patients who, the majority of whom ha did have advanced or metastatic disease. Um, the patients were an enriched cohort, um, and that kind of reflects the referral bias that we have at Mass General. As you can see here, the patients were, actually there are many more females than males that we screened. We tend to see a lot of never and light smokers in our clinic, so you can see that roughly half of our patients were after actually never light smokers, which is much higher than what you would see in the general unselected population. Um, we have a fairly ethnically homogeneous population. Most of our patients are, are Caucasian. And as I just mentioned, many of the patients that we screened, um, close to 70% of them already had metastatic disease at the time of screening. So what we found in our collection of patients, 
um, is the following. We found that actually among the 500 patients, there were about 9% um, who had ALK translocations or rearrangements, and there were uh, specific clinical features that were associated with ALK rearrangements. Um, the first one that, was, um, that has been uh, actually shown in a variety of case series from around the world is that these patients do tend to be young, on average 10 to 15 years younger than non-ALK patients. In addition, we found a roughly equal distribution of men and women with ALK positive lung cancer. And remember, we screened more women than men, so there's a, there appears to be a slight male predominance. And then, like the other um, sort of major subset of uh, lung cancers that we know a lot about, EGFR, we, we know that these, or we found that these patients, by and large, are almost all never or light smokers. Um, as you can see here, less than 10% of these patients had greater than a 10-pack year smoking history. And finally, um, something that's somewhat intriguing and that needs follow-up is that we found that many of our patients with ALK-positive lung cancer did have more even more advanced disease than the patients that we screened, suggesting that ALK may be associated with an aggressive um, biology. So this brings us now to the drug that targets ALK, crizotinib. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It targets both ALK as well as MET. In fact, it was developed um, early on to uh, target MET-amplified cancers. Um, this selectivity profile of crizotinib is shown here, and it's meant to remind me to mention that really it, at the doses that we use clinically, the kinases that are expected to be targeted really are just MET and ALK. So this is the uh, trial design, um, and uh, I should mention that even before we knew about ALK and lung cancer, this trial was already planned to include two phases as shown here, a dose escalation phase, um, sort of the standard dose escalation phase, followed by a dose expansion phase at the maximum tolerated dose that was meant to allow investigators now to focus in on um, the activity of crizotinib in a defined molecularly enriched population of patients. Uh, we actually ended up enrolling the first patient in cohort five, which was at 300 milligrams BID. And this is the first patient that was identified with ALK positive lung cancer at MGH. Now, this phase one trial is actually an international multi-center trial with the major sites shown here by the red stars. Um, at MGH, the trial was led by Dr. Eunice Kwok and Dr. Jeffrey Clark. Um, but there were six other sites as well outside of Boston, including New York, Chicago, Colorado, UC Irvine, Australia, and Korea. Uh, now, the data I'm about, about to show you um, is the most updated data we have on the phase one trial. Um, this data com is updated as of August 7th, and actually it's a little updated from um, Eunice's New England Journal publication. Here we've included over 100 patients that are valuable um, for safety and response. So this is actually an old slide from ASCO, but this is just, again, meant to remind me to tell you about the clinical and demographic features of the patients who enrolled on the phase one trial, and it's pretty much what we have seen um, in, our, in our own patient series, that most of these ALK patients are younger, um, most of these patients are never or light smokers, and almost all of these patients um, do have adenocarcinoma histology. The last thing to note on this slide, actually, and this is an important point, is that most of the patients who went on to this phase one trial were um, heavily pretreated. Uh, they almost all had received prior, at least one prior treatment, and about half of them had received two or more prior treatments. So shown here is the waterfall plot um, of 105 patients. I'm sorry, the colors, actually there was an Apple to uh, PC conversion mistake, so the colors don't quite match up, but I think most of you can uh, get the idea here that there were a few complete responses. There were many uh, partial responses. The response rate was close to 60%. There are qu about 30% more patients who had, who qualified as stable disease, just under 30% tumor reduction. And then the last point here to make is that there were some patients, a minority, rough, less than 10%, who actually did have pr um, disease progression as their best response, suggesting that in some patients, although we believe that ALK does confer oncogene addiction, some patients somehow lose their oncogene addiction. So this is to summarize and give you some numbers on the response rates that were seen in the phase one trial. Again, this is data that was presented at ESMO last month, so this is updated from the paper last week. The response rate was on the order of 56%, um, with 2% complete responses. Um, the response rate appears to be independent of uh, performance status as well as number of prior treatments. You can see that it holds fairly steady, um, independent of, of, these of these various factors.
And shown here is the median progression-free survival curves. Um, the median um, PFS does appear to be on the order of nine months. Um, and you know, just to get to this point of uh, uh, progression. I mean, the, very, the re progression, the responses are fairly heterogeneous, as are the relapses, and we'll probably come back to that in a minute. But the median does appear to be on the order of nine months. This is quite a bit more than what you would expect for a patient with metastatic lung cancer who's received prior therapies. Most single-agent chemotherapies in that setting have a median PFS on the order of, of a few months. So this is some data that we put together and presented at ASCO this year. This is getting at the question, which is very important, of overall survival, and really, does this tyrosine kinase inhibitor also improve overall survival? For those of us who have treated these patients, we certainly believe they do, but we, we need the numbers uh, to show this. So this is actually uh, patients that were seen at MGH only, so this is a single institution. This is taking all the patients that we've identified who have ALK in their lung cancers, and, uh, and about two-thirds of those patients have gone on to the phase one trial. So this red, uh, the red uh, curve here represents all of the ALK patients, the majority of whom have gone on to the phase one trial. The pink um, curve here shows just the subset of ALK patients at MGH who never went on to crizotinib for various reasons. And you can see that there's a very clear difference in survival. We're now in the process of putting this data together from all the phase one sites, and uh, we have a preliminary uh, uh, analysis that shows that there will be a significant improvement in overall survival conferred by crizotinib. So I wanted to just show you two examples of the types of responses that we see, and this is kind of similar to what Dr. Flaherty showed as well with his, um, in the, his melanoma talk, but um, these responses are, are, can be quite rapid and can be quite dramatic. So this is a patient of ours um, at Mass General who uh, is a 50-year-old woman, never a smoker, who had failed two prior lines of therapy. At the time she started treatment, um, her scans are shown here on the left, the pre-treatment scans, and she was symptomatic from her multifocal lung disease. After just eight weeks of treatment, you can now see her scans on the right, which show a dramatic resolution of her uh, multifocal lung opacities. She's uh, typical in that she reported an improvement in her symptoms about one, within about one week of starting on therapy. She actually continues on trial today uh, a little over two years out. This is another patient of mine who I saw at Mass General earlier this, this year. Um, he was also 50 years old, uh, never smoker, had failed multiple prior lines, and was very, very sick, actually, at the time we saw him. You can see his scan on the left shows significant uh, lung burden. He actually had widespread metastases as well. And after being on crizotinib for just 12 weeks, you can see, again, a very dramatic improvement um, in his disease burden. And he also had a very significant improvement in his symptoms very early on. This patient also continues on trial now about seven months out. So as I mentioned earlier, ALK really is not expressed outside um, uh, in normal tissues, and I think this explains why the safety profile is, is so, uh, I would say, relatively spectacular. As you can see here, in terms of the adverse events, most of the adverse events are pretty mild, mostly grade one, some grade two. They're primarily GI, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, there are some other notable side effects. Again, they, they're still very mild, but they're, um, I would say, fairly unique to this drug, which include peripheral edema, some visual changes when patients have to adapt from a dark to a light setting. Um, one that is an important adverse event to note is the hepatotoxicity that has been seen with crizotinib. Um, in about 10% of the patients, there can be LFT abnormalities. They occur at a very typical, stereotypical point in treatment, typically around four weeks after starting on crizotinib, and you can see that there were some grade three as well as grade four um, transaminase elevations. Many of these patients who experienced these LFT abnormalities held their dose, and many of them were able to restart at a lower dose. The last um, AE that I should mention here that's not shown is uh, pneumonitis, and there is um, a, a, the possibility that this drug may rarely cause a drug-induced pneumonitis, but this is still under investigation. So the data from the phase one trial has now led to several trials that are ongoing. Um, actually, again, these are international um, trials. Profile 1007 um, is a r large randomized uh, phase three registration trial. Um, and the key criteria for this trial are that patients have to have ALK rearrangements as demonstrated by FISH. Um, and these patients all have to be in the second line setting. So they have to have failed one prior platinum-based therapy. These patients will be randomized to receive either crizotinib or a standard single, single agent, pemetrexid or docetaxel. Now this trial uh, 
It was not designed as a crossover trial. However, technically, patients who are randomized to the chemotherapy arm will be able to cross over and receive crizotinib. What will happen in this setting is the patients, if they progress on the chemotherapy, they will come off of trial, and they will now be eligible for a companion phase two trial, referred to as Profile 1005. And these patients will now receive crizotinib. So these patients will not, never be deprived of the opportunity to receive the targeted therapy. Now, Profile 1005 is also meant to capture all of the other ALK patients who are beyond second line. So we see many patients who are now on third line and fifth line and even beyond. And those patients would not be eligible for Profile 1007, but they are eligible for Profile 1005. And future crizotinib trials are shown here. There is a first-line trial that is under um, development. This trial will hopefully open first quarter of 2011. It's very similar um, in design as the second-line trial, except these patients are treated up front with either crizotinib or standard combination platinum-based chemotherapy. And also um, in discussion is the possibility of an adjuvant crizotinib trial to address whether or not an adjuvant tyrosine kinase inhibitor in the setting of ALK positive lung cancer also um, sh can show a, a survival benefit. So to summarize, uh, patients with ALK positive lung cancer respond very well to crizotinib, and this is regardless of the number of prior treatments, the gender, age, and performance status. We've seen that uh, to date the median PFS is on the order of nine months, um, and some patients, as I showed you, can have actually very prolonged benefit. Um, our longest patient is over two years at this point. Crizotinib appears to have a very good safety profile, and I should say that our patients actually generally tolerate this medication extremely well. Um, and certainly these trials, the data from the phase one, support the notion that crizotinib may become a new standard of care for patients with ALK-positive lung cancer. So this is a timeline that actually um, Eunice and Pfizer and others have put together, um, showing you, or at least reminding you, of sort of the remarkable time frame which crizotinib has developed over the last couple years. Um, as you can see, that actually the phase one trial initiated a full year before ALK was even discovered in lung cancer. It was summer of 06. Um, and uh, about a year later was when Dr. Mano reported his, his findings. And uh, because of the rapid screening that we were able to perform at MGH, we were able to start our very first ALK patient on this trial in December of 07, so just about four months after the report um, of ALK and lung cancer. And certainly, by, um, as, as I mentioned, the phase three trial is now underway, and we enrolled our first patient in the phase three trial just earlier this year. So it's pretty remarkable. So we don't become too smug about everything. I wanted to just end on this slide, which shows you that we do have a bigger challenge now, which really has to do with crizotinib resistance. Um, and these patients, as I mentioned, the response is somewhat heterogeneous. The relapses can also be somewhat heterogeneous. But this is an example of a patient who I showed you earlier who had a dramatic response, has been on crizotinib for over two years, and is now beginning to relapse. And you can see her, her, her relapsing sort of films here, where you have a small little nodule coming back at about one year of crizotinib therapy, and now at two years, you can see that this area has clearly, has clearly grown. So we're working with the Engelman lab to now begin to understand these mechanisms of resistance. For those of you who read the New England Journal last week, you know that one mechanism that was reported by Dr. Mano has to do with a point mutation within the tyrosine kinase domain of ALK, and there probably are other mechanisms as well. So let me just end by acknowledging all of the phase one sites who participated in this trial at Mass General. As I mentioned, Dr. Kwok and Dr. Clark um, led the phase one trial at Mass General and are actually continuing to run the phase one trial for other patients, including some of our ALK patients who are not eligible for the phase two and phase three trials. And also to thank Dr. Iafredi for all of his work. Um, he screened all of the patients um, that went on to the phase one trial. Thank you very much. I can take questions. a few questions here and when if people are getting their thoughts together I'll just ask you one sure. uh, Alice uh, obviously the success of this was based on predetermining you know ALK status and genotyping these patients and this is a lesson we've learned from the EGFR story which took a long time and we had to enrich this part uh, the patient population. So how robust is this? I know you're doing most of it in central laboratories right now, but moving forward, you're gonna need to have a robust fish test. Uh, uh, and I know we can do it at Mass Channel, but how reproducible is this uh, so that uh, an ALK inhibitor can be used by everybody going forward? Yeah, so 
actually, Mace Rothenberg would probably address the question of diagnostics, but I should say that the fish test can be a little bit finicky, so it's a very valid point. Um, at Mass General, we've been doing, we have a lot of experience um, with the fish test. Um, for the phase three and phase two trials, there is a central lab who is performing the fish test and that um, we've already encountered some issues, potential issues there. So going forward in terms of what the test will be, it, I would say it's not entirely clear. I showed the immunohistochemistry because I do believe that in the future, immunohistochemistry will probably be uh, technically a uh, more accessible assay for especially local labs to do. So we'll, we're waiting for uh, commercially available antibodies that will allow us to have a very robust immunohistochemistry assay. But for, for now, the current standard is really to use fish at the central lab. Alice, there's some unexplained clinical characteristics for both EGFR and ALK, and you mentioned the kind of bizarre female to, s to, to male sex ratio, which seems inverted. There's also the increased prevalence in Asians, and then there's the whole pathology of multifocal disease with some bronchoalveolar differentiation and so on. Are these all tracked differently between ALK and EGFR, or do you have thoughts about what the mechanisms might be there? Uh, I mean you're right, there are some interesting similarities and yet differences between these two subsets. Sub sub subsets. I would say they're both um, never smokers subsets of lung cancer. I think it's pretty clear that these patients, clearly most of them are never smokers. But I would say differences we don't understand fully. So the age is a very, um, I would say it's a pretty uh, marked um, observation that multiple groups have made that these patients are on the young side. And we have very young patients, even in, in their late teens, who have alk rearrangements. Um, and we don't understand that either. So we don't understand the gender, sort of the gender bias, and we don't understand the age age distribution. I think it's just too early um, yet to know, all of, to know all of these relationships. Alice, thank you very much for a, for a superb presentation. It occurred to me uh, for the members of the audience who might uh, find of interest in the issue of the oncologist that's at each of your seats, uh, an editorial written by our host, Bruce Chabner. This is not a paid political announcement. Uh, in a, um, by Bruce, in fact, it, it, it was attributed to um, a, a superb spy network at Mass General that the editorial appeared before the New England Journal article actually was published. And I, I commend it to your attention. If you haven't read it, please do so. And if you haven't talked with Bruce about it, uh, be prepared for uh, a very enlightening and engaging discussion. Hi, Alex. Um, the question is, you, you made the statement that this uh, disease is predominantly a non-smoker disease, but in the numbers that you showed, it seemed like at least 25% of the patients have either had light smoking histories or uh, heavy smoking histories. So does the heterogeneity of primary response track with, with a previous history of, of smoking at all? You know, th uh, there haven't been enough significant smokers to really track that, at least in, in I would say, it in my experience at MGH. but. Uh, I should say those, what I call it smokers is greater than 10 pack years. Many of those patients were still less than sort of the average smoker you might see, so they might have been 12 pack years or 15 pack years, relatively on, on the light side. And then also the so-called light smokers were people who might have only smoked for two years in college and they're called light smokers. So if we were able to go back, if we had, if, as we accumulate more patients, we'll go back and look probably by sort of pack. Exception in prostate uh, where you know, there's like a 2% frequency of a translocation to BRAF that was discovered and published in Nature Genetics by Ruel Chanayan. Um, those are sort of the things that have emerged so far. What have you learned about the MET side of the story? Uh, as you know, this was initially thought to be working in the MET Amplified, and uh, what have we learned in the MET side in lung cancer in this trial? So, I mean, I would say that um, the initial reports of MET amplification in lung cancer I think in reality the, es the estimates are were probably too high initially because we see very, very few cases of MET amplified lung cancers. There are other MET amplified tumors though and some of these patients have enrolled on the phase one trial actually. Um, and I, I guess it's anecdotal still so I can't really comment. Um, but it's not clear, it's not clear yet to me how, how well it works for MET amplified <coughs> cancers and that may be a function of the drug or it could be a function of the fact that perhaps MET isn't, these tumors aren't as addicted to MET signaling. Um, given the length of time it took to um, learn about the incidence yeah. of EGFR mutation in African Americans, I'm wondering um, what efforts have been made to get tumor from African American patients for the ALK trial? Uh, so, I mean, 
I know the sponsor is actually looking worldwide um, for collaborators to address this very question about the uh, distribution of of patients by ethnicity are what are the what are the frequencies like we already know that in Asia there is a higher incidence of ALK. Um, I'm not sure I don't know the details we can actually ask Dr. Rothenberg about this in terms of looking for example either in the US um, or in other um, for example African countries at at the uh, incidence um, in in African Americans. So one more question when the response rate is this high as 56 percent got to ask a question about those handful of patients who are showing the progressive disease as the best response. What do we know about them? Is that a diagnostic error, or is it a different biology, a different translocation? It's a very good question. Um, we, we don't know, and I can only uh, comment on the patients that we've had at MGH who've had sort of progressive disease as, as their best response, and we had two of them. Um, and we did go back with Dr. Ayafrady and review those to make sure that they definitely were ALK positive, and they were confirmed ALK positive by FISH. Um, and by, um, in at least one case, by immunohistochemistry as well. So we believe that at least for two of those cases that I showed you, they were truly ALK positive. But as I mentioned, we don't understand yet why some of the, a small minority of tumors do seem to lose their, their addiction. We don't know why.